Okay, welcome everybody into Synergy Bible College. And uh, we're beginning what's really one of my favorite subjects, and that is Christian theology. Uh, and it's been known as systematic theology. Um, years ago, we changed it to Christian theology because we you know, had mostly not theologians that were going to our school and we weren't really doing master level classes. And so we said, maybe this might scare some people away. You know, some folks didn't really understand what systematic theology was. We changed it to, to Christian theology, but it's still really just systematic theology. And systematic theology um, really is the study of the theology uh, by definition. It's the quest for the ultimate truth about God about ourself, about the world we live in, and where else, uh, where else is there to talk about than from the Scripture itself, that God has explained Himself fully in the Scripture. God has explained uh, the, the evil that's in the world. You know, uh, people that are atheists, their biggest problem with the Bible um, or their biggest problem with um, God is if there's a good God, then why can evil be allowed to exist the way it does? Why are there starving children around the world? Why are there? Why is there rape? Why is there, um, you know, all those terrible things that happen to people? And so that's one of their biggest questions. The great thing about the Scripture is it tells us all about God that we need to know about. It tells us all about the creation that we need to know about. It tells us all about man and the nature of man and the fall of man and the sin of man and why they do the things that they do. Um, it doesn't contradict science. It goes with science. And I've, I've shown that from two different directions. Um, there was a, a long period of time um, that, and I'm not saying that I'm out of that time actually, um, where I would have you know, easily said, the world could be, or the universe could be 13.8 billion years old, and it doesn't change the Bible for me. Um, the world could have been 4.3 billion years old, and that doesn't change the Bible for me at all. Um, and for a while there, um, I was pretty firm that it probably is that old. Um, and so that's just me being honest with you. It went against most of my Christian friends' theology. I didn't believe in evolution at any point. But I did believe that it's possible that the Lord could have had many creations prior to us and probably may have creations after us. Um, he is an infinite God. He's creative. Uh, he likes making things. Uh, there's nothing to me beyond God creating all of these things. Um, and, and my answer to that, if, if, the, if the universe is 13.8 billion years old and it's not and it, it's not just made to look old, um, then the explanation for that is still found in Scripture. And that is that, first of all, the Bible says that He stretches out the heavens. And, and so it, it kind of becomes something that can be contradictory in a sense, but at the same time not. Um, and what I mean in, in the mind of people. Um, you could take this and you could say, well, that's a play on words. Um, but when you look at time and space, for instance, and time and space will freak your mind out, and uh, there's going to be a, an episode coming up soon I'm going to be doing on, on another, on another uh, podcast that I do where I'm talking about time and space, and, and it, and it, it kind of messes with you a little bit. But when you look at time and space, according to Scripture, everything is complete and done. I mean, even Judgment Day, everything is done. Uh, and, and not to freak you out, but this is a theology class for students who are deep in the Lord and have believed in Christ for a very long time. And so I shouldn't be able to throw you off too far with some deeper thoughts, all right? But I want you to think for just a minute about something that seems like it contradicts. It doesn't contradict if you understand, and this is what's funny, um, <clears throat> if we understand uh, Einstein, for instance, uh, it, it's an, it's an, an uh, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity actually helps us understand some things about the Bible, believe it or not. There are some external things that can help us understand some biblical realities. Um, and, of course, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate one that reveals to us. But there's some helpful things. And, and, and he showed that um, time and space wasn't really... Um, in order, like this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, but more, it all happened at the same time. And, and, and time and space is simply spread out. 
and um, and it'd be like if you took a piece of paper and you crunched it up, all right, into a little ball, and you just crunched it up, and then you took a, a pencil and you and you shoved it right through all of that paper. Then you open that paper back up. You would have points all throughout that piece of paper. Um, and the only reason those points are no longer next to each other is because they've been spread out. All right, so time has spread them out now. And time has a beginning. That's something that they didn't believe for a long time. Uh, Einstein and those people that were with him in the days did not believe, um, they believed in a static universe, that the, the, the universe was just um, still and didn't move and it was forever. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was constant and had always existed. But then, um, eventually, it was proven that there was a beginning and they called it the Big Bang Theory. And they were able to prove that if you, if you look at the, at the speed at which the, the universe is expanding, and one thing about that is kind of weird, is it expanding faster and faster instead of slowing down, but, but it's expanding. If you go back in time and you reverse that, um, they say it comes back to a singularity, a, a, a one tiny little ball the size of a of seed that had so much power and energy that everything in the entire universe exploded from it in a moment of time. And it, and it just exploded through the universe and, and eventually we ended up where we are. Well, um, whether or not that's true, nobody was there to observe it. All right. So one thing about science is there has to be someone there to observe it in order to say something actually happened. Otherwise, it's called, it, it's, it's called um, a theory. And that, that's why it's called the theory um, of relativity and the theory of evolution and the theory of this and the Big Bang Theory. Uh, because nobody knows for sure because they weren't there watching. The only one there watching was God himself. And um, but one argument was, you know, um, for for the for the idea that the universe is not actually that old in one sense, but in another sense that it is that old, is the idea that Adam and Eve were created as fully formed human beings, and so they were adults, all right, but they were actually babies. I mean, if you actually think about it, they were a day old, all right. So when they first came in this world, they were a day old, all right but they were full grown adults. So God had actually, uh, in a sense, sped up time for them, or you could say he created them as fully grown humans. All right. In the same way, isn't it possible that God created the universe as a fully grown universe? Um, meaning that when the Bible says he stretched out the heavens with his hand, that he literally took what, what was all together, you know, and what would have kept there from being any time, and in a moment of time, he, he literally created time um, and he, he spread it out. And so with his hand, he, he did this. And when he, when he did this, 13.8 billion years worth of time seemed to exist. But the reality was it was in a moment of time, in a second, in a, when he said, light be, um, I mean, boom, light was there. And that light, we know, like for instance, when he said, um, and then on a certain day, he, he made the stars um, and the moon uh, also and, and those things. Well, it was, it was actually in, a, in an instant. It didn't say that it took a long time. It said on this day, and, and, and it's the word uh, uh, yam, and it's, it literally means a 24-hour period of time. All right, so it's not, it's not, a, uh, uh, it's not theoretical. It's a, an actual 24-hour period period of time. So God stretched out the heavens and in just a, a just a, a fragment of time was able to do that. And therefore, in a sense, it's 13.8 billion years old, the way that um, Adam was probably 30 years old or 20 years old. You know, in other words, in, in his appearance, he appeared to be that old. And in the same way, at the very least, the universe is made to, to seem to look that old because God in a second spread it out and created it that way. Uh, if it happened that way, or God decided in his own wisdom that he wanted to, um, to, to do it through a process that took a long time, um, it doesn't matter because God is not even inside of time and space. And so he's so far beyond our way of thinking about time and space, he lives outside of it. That's why he can know what's coming. He can know what's, what's going to happen, what 
um, has happened, what hasn't happened, um, you know, yet he already has seen it. He's, he's been there. He actually pops up and visits at different times. You can see uh, something the Bible calls the angel of the Lord. All through the Bible, it's called the angel of the Lord. Um, that almost every theologian, really, I don't know of a theologian that disagrees. Um, every theologian essentially says, every time it says, not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord, all right, the angel of the Lord, that that's talking about Jesus Christ appearing here on earth without a body before he physically was born on earth. Um, he was there, the angel of the Lord was there with Gideon when he was threshing uh, wheat, and he sat down and said, hey, mighty man of valor, and it called him the angel of the Lord. And that word angel there, um, it, it can be translated angel, or it can be translated as a messenger. Um, um, and, and by the way, in the New Testament, the same thing happens. Uh, this is very strange for a lot of people, but uh, when we do, angel, angelology, do uh, angelology and demonology, um, and we look at angels and demons all in the Old and New Testament, this is very strange, but the word angelos that is translated angel many times, did you know that that's the same word that's translated for John the Baptist? Um, that John the Baptist said uh, that, that I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and, and he called himself the messenger. Um, that word is angelos, uh, angel. He called himself an angel of the Lord. <laughs> and so it's the same word. Not only that, in Revelation, when he said, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write this, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write this, and, and all these things, it's the same word, angelos. And so messenger, uh, one translation says it means pastor to the pastor of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. And so it probably wasn't talking to an angel. It probably was delivering it to an actual messenger of that church. It makes more sense biblically. Um, it makes sense in the context that he said, deliver this to the, to the leader of that church and tell them these things that I'm saying. All right, so he tells John, seal this up, take this to the messenger. Um, and, that, and that's the same word used for John the Baptist, same word used for angels that literally we know they're talking about actual angels because of the context. Um, uh, when he says, aren't, they, aren't angels all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who, have, who are heirs of salvation? In that particular scripture in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, He's talking about spiritual angels, and it's easy to tell the difference when he's speaking. Usually, it's easy to tell the difference when he's talking about human messengers or angelic beings being the messengers. But there's something to think about when you're thinking about this subject. And so it's a, it's a broad subject when you study God because you're literally studying everything. There is nothing that God is not a part of. There's nothing that God did not have a hand in. Um, and that's why we're going to get into some deep stuff. Now, your notes say uh, Dr. Mike Harrison. That's because my dad, Dr. Mike Harrison, um, wrote at least part of this. Um, and I say that is because at the present moment, we don't have all of it. We're missing most of it. Uh, and we have a little bit of it. Um, but I decided I'm not going to leave it out. I'm going to go through some of the things that he wrote down. And if the rest of it happens to pop up, we'll take it. And if not, I'm going to teach by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, the same things. I, I've went through the class multiple times, and I've actually taught this class for my dad. And it's probably why part of the the uh, probably why part of the notes are gone right now. <laughs> it's my fault because I was teaching it, and I somehow deleted it. But anyway, um, so the study, uh, or or you could call the science of God. Um, theology will also seek to understand God's creation, particularly man and his condition, and God's redemptive work in relation to mankind. Now, um, this uh, it was spoken of by a man named Erickson, and this is in your list. There is going to be a list. Uh, there is a syllabus that has a list of books. And so the, the first thing I said about the study of God by definition um, that's found in Hart's book uh, in the second, uh, the second page. And so um, you'll see when it mentions a name of a writer and then it gives you a page number, that's based on your syllabus that gives you a bunch of other books you can find to study theology. And you can look in those books and that, those quotes are found right there on those pages. 
Um, listen to this. Systematic theology is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today on any given topic? And this is so important. It's not as general as you think. Systematic theology is saying, what I believe here cannot contradict what I believe over here. And you would not believe how many people have a certain thing about... How many of you have ever heard God say, um, it'll all work out in His timing? All right, we've heard that before said a million times. Um, the Bible doesn't say that, but people say that. Or people will say things like, um, you know, um, uh, look, er everything is meant to be. You know, uh, especially when you're going through a hard time and something terrible has happened. Um, you can say, well, you know what, you know, everything's meant to be. If, if it happened, it, it was meant to be. All right. And so that is a, a popular statement. Uh, it's not gotten from the Bible, but it's a popular statement. And it's meant to try to comfort people. But if you think about it, it really should do the opposite. It shouldn't comfort you. It should terrify you. If you serve a God that is that horrible, that, that he meant for your child to be killed in a car wreck and that he meant for your house to burn up and that he meant for you to get leukemia and that he meant for horrible things to happen to you. That is just simply not the God of the Bible. Um, and so when we study theology, you can't say on the one hand, God is sovereign and, and nothing happens without his approval. All right. And then on the other hand, say God is good and God protects his children and God watches over his children. Those are contradictory statements, all right? So what you believe about God's protection for his children cannot contradict what you believe about God's sovereignty. And, and I want to take a moment to mention that the word sovereignty is not found in the Bible. Um, that's something to think about. Now, there's a lot of theological concepts that are not found in the Bible specifically, like the rapture um, and things like that. But sometimes we talk about sovereignty as if it is in the Bible. Um, and it's not in the Bible. The only place you will find it in the Bible is in a particular translation. Um, uh, generally, I think it's the NIV and, it, and also the NLT. Um, and I like both of those translations for reading, um, but if you're really going to study, they're not great translations. Um, every time it says the word Lord, um, they will put in that place, O Sovereign Lord. Uh, the word sovereign is not there. It doesn't exist. It's not in the original Hebrew. It's not in the Greek. It is not in the Bible. All right. So the word sovereign Lord or sovereign God, that's just made up by man. Uh, human just human said, well, it'll help us understand what he means by God here if we'll just add the word sovereign in here. Well, then everybody takes their own definition for sovereign and then they pop it in there for what they believe about who God is. Sovereignty cannot mean God is in charge of everything that happens on earth, all right? If God is sovereign in that way, then number one, he is evil. And number two, he's done a pretty terrible job at creating and maintaining his creation. And that, that, that's some bold words, but uh, from somebody who doesn't believe in, in sovereignty in the way that others do, um, I think that, that it is hateful um, to teach a God that is sovereign in the sense that nothing happens without his okay. Um, and people would say, well, it has to be. It has to be with his okay. It has to be that God okayed it. Otherwise, if, if you know, because he created everything. And so how could anything happen that he didn't give an okay to? Well, there's a very simple answer for that. And that is just like there are in physics, there are certain... Um, I guess, rules that govern the universe, that physics, um, that without, if you take one of those rules out, the whole thing falls apart, all right? In the same way, God has rules that he has created, and he said, everything's going to work by these rules. And don't worry, we're going to get into scripture, okay? But, but, but everything has to go by these rules, all right? And, and, and so when, um, when God says something, um, in fact, his word says this, that, that you have elevated your word above your name. Now, that's a very just mind-boggling type of a verse. But God's word says you have elevated your word above your name. What he's saying is your word is up there. Jesus Christ is literally called the word of God. 
And, 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 in, and in John chapter 1, he says that in the beginning was the Word. All right, and, 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 and the Word was with God. And then listen to this. The Word was God. And without Him, Jesus Christ, was nothing made that was made. So everything that was made was made by God, and there was nothing made that wasn't made by Him, uh, and for Him, and through Him, and with Him. All right, well, then that brings us to the question of the devil. Um, if God is good, and if there is no evil in Him, and if, there, if, if, if God did not intend evil, then um, how did we get here to where there is a Satan, there's a tempter, there's destruction, there's starvation, there is rape, there is evil, there is all these terrible things. Why is Satan allowed to, to be here? And the question that's most often asked is, why did God put us here in a uh, place where there was a fallen Satan? And that question used to haunt me for a long time because I didn't have an answer for it. And so my friends would say, you know, uh, you know, if God is good, why would he put us here with a, with a Satan who, has, who, has, who was already here? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't sound like a very good God that would put us here with a devil that's already evil. Well, the answer is God did not put us here with a devil who, is, who was evil, period. Um, we have proof of that in the scripture. And, and that's why I want you to look at Genesis chapter number one, um, because Satan appears pretty soon in the book of Genesis. But I want you to notice that every time God made something, all right, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and empty. All right. And darkness was upon the face of the waters. And listen to this. The spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, ne pay attention to these next words, because they are words that are spoken um, over and over and over in Genesis chapter 1. All right? And God saw the light, and it was good. And he separated the light from the, from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning came, and that was the first day. All right, then every day God creates something, and then he says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and God saw that it was good over and over and over. And then when he makes man, because people say, how could God put man here with an evil devil? Well, he didn't. Um, the Bible says in uh, Genesis chapter 1, and, and now people are going to start asking, well, 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 then how did that happen? How did the devil get here? When did he get here? And all that. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> we'll get there. But Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make humans, human beings in our image to be like us. Now we see the, the in the way the speaking there, what do we see? We see the Trinity um, because he said, let us make man in our image, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make them in our image. Now, now, what are we made of? We are made of spirit, soul, and body. We are a, a triune being. We are one person, and yet we have three distinct um, uh, personalities or three distinct uh, uh, parts of us that are Father, or excuse me, that are, are spirit, soul, and body, just like God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, we are spirit, soul, and body. We are a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. We've got to have all of those things to operate in this earth. And, and really, one of the most important things that you can ever understand about why is evil happening in the earth. All right. This answers it starting about right here. And, and we could say verse uh, 26. He said, then let us let us make man or human beings in our image to be like us. They will listen to what it says. They will reign over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and, 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 and the livestock and the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God made human beings in his own image. In the likeness of God, he made them male and female. He created them. Then he blessed them. Now listen closely to the wording. And he said these words. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And here's a key word that answers a lot of questions. 
and govern it. All right. He said, fill the earth and then govern the earth. All right. Then he says, reign over all the fish in the sea and all the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry upon the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the whole earth. So God made us as plant eaters to begin with. And he said, and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given you every plant as food for the wild animals and the birds of the, uh, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. And then God looked. So God said, have dominion. You're going to reign over everything. There's going to be nothing that creeps on the earth. And that includes Satan, all right, that creeps on the earth. Nothing that is not under your dominion. Everything here is under your dominion. And then it says, then God looked over all that he had made. And he said, it was very good. Now, let me ask a question. If Satan was here at that time, at an, as an evil tempter to tempt, to steal, kill, destroy, to bring destruction to millions, to bring diseases, to bring all kinds of horrible things, then God would have been lying um, if he would have said everything is very good at this point, uh, wouldn't he? I mean, you'd have to say that God wasn't telling the truth if there was a devil lurking around who was evil. If God said, I saw it all, I looked. So in other words, now everything's made. Humans are made, everything. There's nothing made that, that, that hasn't been made. God's made it all now. And by the way, he never made anything else, all right? Um, and, 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 and so this is it. He made it all. He made it where it would reproduce after itself. And so he wouldn't have to make anything else. Um, and and, and that, that was the end of his making of anything. And, and then God said, everything is good. All right. And then we continue reading and it begins to tell in chapter two how everything came about. In other words, chapter one, God spoke and it was done. But then in chapter two, we see that that it, it wasn't necessarily that that just instantly um, all the trees just grew up like in um, one of the movies that are out there. You know, um, it says uh, in chapter two, God planted a garden. All right. I think that's very interesting. God went out and he planted a garden. He himself why did he plant a garden? Why did God have to plant a garden? Why did God just go ahead and, and just say, garden be? I mean, he had done that for days. Well, after he had set everything in motion, said, okay, I'm done, and he rested. From that point on, God follows his own rules. All right, everything that governs the earth, God uses those rules. And he tells us um, in the very next chapter that seed time and harvest will continue and it will happen as long as their winter and summer and as long as the earth remains. There will be seed time and harvest. And in other words, there won't be a harvest unless there's a seed time. So there's got to be a time in which, um, in which there's a seed time or a time of planting or there won't be a harvest. And so there was no man yet to do the work, the Bible says, and so the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day. And then it says um, that, that when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grants, I mean, sorry, nor grains nor growing on the earth, there was none. This is, this is very interesting. God had said, let all these things be. And then it says, and, the, and when the Lord made it, and when the Lord made the earth and the heavens. Now, this is, in other words, when he first made the earth and the heavens. They were just sitting there, but there were no wild plants. There were, there were nothing. There was nothing there. It was just an empty earth. And, and then it says, neither was there wild plants, nor were there any grains. There, no, there, was, there's, there was nothing growing on the earth. And, and then watch this. For the Lord God had not sent rain to the earth. See, this makes sense because God is saying, I know what it takes to run this thing. All right. And until I'm ready to release this rain, uh, I'm not going to be able to produce the kind of crops that I'm going to produce. Um, and then it says this, and um, the second reason that God didn't yet uh, plant these things is it says there were no people yet to cultivate the soil. And so God needed us to have the brains and the ability and the hands to actually cultivate the soil. 
And then it said, instead, springs came up from the ground and watered the earth daily. But then listen to this. Then the Lord God formed the man. So we already said, God said, let us make man. And it was so. But now we see God actually doing what he said. I think this is an awesome action because the scripture tells us um, to, uh, to imitate God. All right, we're told to be imitators of God as dear children. All right. So if we're going to be an imitator of God as dear children, then we need to be people who speak and consider it so. All right. The Bible says that, that he calls those things that be not as though they already are. But then did he sit there and do nothing? No. You know what he did? He said, man, be. All right. And, and it was so. And yet there was no man. All right. So God spoke it. And as far as God was concerned, there was man. But then God formed, verse 7, he formed man from the dust of the ground. So God said, man is here. And it was so as far as God was concerned. He didn't even consider it not being done. Yet he still took dirt and he still formed a man on the ground. And then it says he breathed into, his, into him the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. And that word actually is translated soul. Uh, he became a living soul and, uh, uh, and can also be translated spirit there, a living spirit or a living soul. It's a, it's a word there that can mean either one. And, and by the way, all through the Bible, it's used. Sometimes it's translated soul, sometimes translated spirit. And that, I, think there's, I think there's a reason for confusion at times um, in some translations because of that. But he created a living being. Um, you could say the essence of a man. Everything that, that, that makes that person what they are, God created it on this day. And then God planted a garden, very interesting, uh, in Eden, eastern, uh, the, in the eastern place, and he placed the man he had made. And the Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground. So he did make them grow up, and trees were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. And in the middle was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then rivers begin to flow. And then as you know, God then gave one commandment. You can eat from any tree that you want, but don't eat from this tree. Now, it's, it's been speculated that this tree was a, uh, was a literal tree. It's been speculated this tree uh, represents something. Um, I think that probably it's somewhere in the middle. What I mean by that is I think it was a literal tree. But what I think is what he was saying is if you disobey me, I mean, he could have picked any tree he wanted to. And essentially, the moment you disobey God, you are entering into good and evil. All right. And so the knowledge of good and evil, let me explain something. Um, most Christians want to be free of a life of sin. They don't want to just go out and sin. Most Christians don't want to go out and sin. I mean, Christians want to be Christ-like. They don't know why they do what they do. They struggle. They argue. They fight. They're like, why can't I just get this right? All right. Well, um, here's what happens. Um, you're eating out of the wrong tree. Um, there is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right. Now, what does that mean? Find out how much good I can do and then try to do it. Find out how much evil there is and then avoid it. And then I'll be okay. All right. And essentially, he was saying, stay away from living that way. Stay away from living in a state of trying to avoid evil to be righteous and trying to do enough good to be righteous. And just live in the tree of life, which is relationship with God. And, and if you'll stay there in relationship with God, then you won't have to worry about getting off the path. And so where did the tempter come from? Um, in, in this particular class itself, where we may not get that far, but I will begin to tell you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something to think about, and in the next class, I'm going to actually hit it um, because we're going we're gonna to hit some more things that my dad had written down here I think is important to see at the beginning on learning about theology. But you got to know these things that the first three chapters of Genesis set up the whole Bible. And I really think without the first three chapters of Genesis, it's almost impossible to really understand the gospel, to understand why God is who he is, why anything works the way it works. I think, I think that chapter, 
those three chapters are some of the most important chapters in the entire scripture to help us understand everything about God, man, sin, Satan, why things happen, all of it. Um, because God works through authority. Pay close attention to this. Who did God give authority to? He gave authority to man, didn't he? Now, once God gives authority to man, he does not take that authority back. All right. And so he had given it to man. Now, God himself is going to work through man if he wants to do something. That's why from that point on, God never himself intervenes outside of using man. When he went and brought the curses down on Egypt, who did he use? Moses, he used a man, all right? Uh, you know, when he went to save all the, the animals that were left uh, before he destroyed the world in the flood, what did he do? He used a man named Noah to preach righteousness for a hundred years and try to get everybody in the ark and build the ark, and only eight people listened. And they, some people say it should be about according to how long they lived and how many babies they had. There was at least a billion people on earth. So imagine a world 4,000 years ago with a billion people already living on it. And yet they had to be wiped away and only eight people started fresh because God said every intention of their heart was continually on evil. All right. But here's what we're going to find some f f food for thought before we hit these other points of my dad's here. Food for thought is this. There are not three judgments in Genesis chapter three. There are four judgments, all right? Not three, but four. Now, this is very important. Um, there is a, a judgment for, um, for Adam, for his sin. There's a judgment for Eve, for her sin. There's a judgment for the serpent, because he sinned. And people don't think about this. People think the serpent is just a symbol for Satan. No, he is called the most subtle, cunning creature on the planet. So when Satan decided to use somebody to deceive Eve, he used a talking snake. Apparently they could speak and communicate. There was an, uh, think about it, Eve didn't think it was weird that a snake was talking to her. All right, so she lived in a whole different kind of world because she was having a conversation with him every day and didn't think it was weird. But then God, when he judged the snake, said, okay, now you're going to crawl on your belly you're going to eat dust. You're going to be like the cattle of the field. In other words, you're not going to speak. You're not going to be able to have legs anymore. You're, going to, you're just going to crawl on your ground. And he said, and yet you'll, and, and you'll strike his feet. But then he gives a fourth judgment, and that's in Genesis 3.15. And this is clearly a reference to the cross and the defeating of Satan. So we see the serpent as a literal serpent, but now we see God talking to the serpent as Satan, saying Satan used this serpent to get to Eve and ultimately Adam. And so he gives a fourth judgment. All right, first judgment to Adam, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. Then to Eve, you're going to have pain in childbirth. Then to the snake, you're going to crawl on your belly. Um, and then finally to Satan. Satan. Did you know that Satan and Adam were judged on the same day? Uh, let me tell you why. Adam didn't have the, excuse me, the snake did not have the authority to bring sin or death into the world. This is something I didn't think about until recently, Stephen. He didn't have, all right, the snake did not have the authority to bring death to the earth. Satan didn't have the authority to bring sickness to the earth. Satan didn't have authority to do anything. All right, he needed a man. Man was the one with authority. And so that's why he craftily used this snake to get to Eve and ultimately to Adam. All right. And, and then ultimately, Adam gave the right to Satan. And then Satan used the right that he got from man to bring sickness, disease, poverty, lack, depression, oppression, malady, malfunction, divorce, sin, and all of the things that we see that happen today because of the fall of man. There was a fourth judgment, and he said, the seed of the woman, all right, which is obviously talking about the virgin birth because women don't have seed. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent and, and you'll strike his heel, but he will crush your head. That's talking about the total defeat of Satan on the cross. That's a fourth judgment. And so even though he used the, the, the tapestry of, of, a, of a snake to explain Satan because that's the animal Satan used, was a snake, 
um, he was speaking prophetically here. Everybody says, and every theologian agrees, this is the very first prophecy about Christ ending the power of Satan. Now, uh, here in your notes, my dad says this about um, theology. He says that J. Robin Williams defines theology in this way. Theology sets forth what the Christian faith teaches, affirms, holds to be true, and its doctrine. Theology is concerned with what is true in its totality. Um, the word theology is used to refer not only to God, but also to the whole of his relations to the world and to man. Uh, in, in theology, we never have an area of God speaking about something that is not important and central to mankind. God doesn't just talk about things that aren't important. God is speaking every time about something that has to do with us and our lives and that, 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 that deals with human beings. All right, so the discipline of systematic theology is you can't believe something here that contradicts something here. So biblical theology, um, it, what does the Bible say about God? That's biblical theology. What does the Bible say about God? There's historical theology. What does theologians say about God in the past? That, that's important. We're going to hit some of what uh, different theologians said during some of our classes. There's philosophical theology. What has the philosopher said about God? There's uh, contemporary theology. What are the present theolo or theologies that are currently in society, the way people are thinking about theology? Uh, number five, there are pastoral theologies. Um, what are the theological foundations for caring for people? And finally, practical theology. What are the theological frameworks that determine the practices of Christians and the normal Christian life and Christian ministry? and how all of that should be done. That's found in the study of God, in the study of theology. Now, major themes and terminology that you're going to be hearing uh, in the next um, seven lessons after, after today, this is, this is one and seven more times, um, you're, going to, you're going to be hearing uh, the word theology, the study of God. You're going to hear the doctrine of creation, uh, um, uh, estimology, uh, Estimology, I can never say the word, uh, the theology of how God reveals himself uh, in Revelation. Uh, anthropology, the study of man. Um, harmonology, the study of sin. Uh, Christology, uh, the, the study of the person of Christ. And by the way, uh, Synergy already online has a complete and total um, uh, teaching uh, on the person of Jesus Christ in, in, in full understanding. Then uh, uh, pneumonology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. And um, we're going to be going through that. Um, we've got a, a class called um, the, the Person and Work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm looking forward to teaching that class. We've also got another one called the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so that's very powerful. Soteriology, the study of salvation and redemption. And then, and then uh, of course, eschatology, the study of in things. And then... Um, ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. All of these things are things that we will hit in different formats from different angles, um, but directly from the Word of God. Now listen to uh, what my, my father said in these two paragraphs here to end. Systematic, to end this session, systematic theology seeks to interpret the major biblical themes while maintaining a continuity in belief within the context of the entire Bible. All right, what I said before, one thing here that you believe can't contradict something else you believe over here. What is believed about one category cannot contradict the teachings of another category. By systematic, developing the, uh, the components of each theology, the researcher must build one truth upon another truth, keeping the integrity of each one um, and attempting not to break down something they said earlier. Now, this is not as easy as it sounds. You begin to have some certain thoughts and certain beliefs, and the longer you go, then you hit something 
that actually tears down the entire, uh, the entire house of cards that you had built. Um, because it was really built on something that was a little bit weak and you finally found an error somewhere and it caused the entire thing to come falling down. Systematic theology keeps that from happening. And so um, the points, uh, the, the, the components of systematic theology can best be understood by the, uh, by the uh, metaphor of spokes in a wheel. Each spoke is essential for the balance and each one is connected to the whole. And so we want to make sure that we hit all of these different kinds of points um, and that we make sure that none of them are bent or twisted in the wrong way that goes against another one. So there brings perfect balance to our ride so that when we're done, we understand God, we understand man, we understand why we suffer, we understand uh, that God wants to heal, we understand there's a paradox in faith, we understand all of these different things. We're going to hit some of the deepest most difficult subjects as we go along the way. All right, we'll see you in just a few minutes on part two of Christian Theology 101. God bless you guys.